Getting ready for Christmas. I would dare say most of us have already started making the preparations. If you're like my household, the decorations have already gone up. Maybe some of you are running a little behind. You know you're supposed to get those things up right after Thanksgiving, right? What about before Thanksgiving? No. Well, ours kind of went up before Thanksgiving because we had to be out of town. But by now, a lot of people are already starting to put up the Christmas lights and the stuff's come down out of the attic. and The tree's being put together or maybe gone out and cut down. Gifts are being wrapped or gifts are being ordered. You're listening to the Christmas songs on the radio. Everybody's sort of getting into the Christmas spirit. I've entitled this morning's series that I'm starting off. It's simply this, preparing for Christmas. How would God have us prepare for Christmas? Now, obviously, nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to celebrate Christmas. But I see nothing wrong with it because it gives us a unique time to point the world to Jesus Christ. So I'm all for Christmas. Anytime we can point people to Jesus, I'm all for it. So I got to thinking, how would God have us prepare for the Christmas season? And I thought well, one of the best ways we can find out how to prepare is by going back into the Bible itself and looking at how God got the various characters prepared for the very first Christmas. How He prepared them, how He wanted them to respond concerning the entry of His Son into this world. So we're going to start this morning with this series in Luke chapter 1. And we're going to start off with a, a, a couple that, that, that might seem a little obscure to some of you. And this couple's name is Zechariah and Elizabeth. And you may think, well, John, they're not really Christmas characters. I would agree with, with you that probably traditional thinking, maybe they're, they're not, or I should say maybe contemporary thinking. But when I look in Luke's gospel, it seems apparent that Luke wants them included in the Christmas story. If you'll notice in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, uh, the birth of John the Baptist is foretold. And then it alternates and picks up with the birth of Jesus being foretold. And then it picks back up again with the birth of John the Baptist. And then it picks up again with the birth of Jesus. So do you, do you see how Luke has John the Baptist foretold? Jesus foretold? John the Baptist born? Jesus born? So he's sort of interwoven uh, these characters together and, and made them all a part of, of, of one story, if you will. So I believe it's important if we're going to learn how to prepare for Christmas that we start off with Zechariah and Elizabeth. So let's look at Luke chapter 1. I'll start reading in verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and to the disobedient to wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord." Wonderful announcement. By the way, the word angel means messenger, and this is a great message that the angel Gabriel is bringing to Zechariah, this priest. So keep in mind, he is at the temple in Jerusalem. There's only one temple, a whole lot of synagogues, but only one temple where the animal sacrifices took place. And at this particular time, they had priests running out the ears, so to speak. They had more priests than they knew what to do with, so to speak. There were lots of priests, but only one 
temple. Now, according to the sources outside Scripture and Scripture itself as well, there were 24 divisions of priests and they had duty twice a year for a week each time as well as the major festivals. Uh, these priests look forward to their week of service at the temple above all else. They didn't get to serve as often as they liked to serve because there were just so many of them. So when God sends this, what I'm going to call preparatory Christmas message to Zechariah, it's his turn or his division's turn to be on duty. They'd be kind of a roster and they would choose from the roster who was to be serving at the temple. But it even got more specific than that when it came to whose turn it was to go in and burn the incense in the temple. Only one guy was to go in there and do that. And from what I, I can gather, uh, it was such an honor, such an honor that offering this incense before God was only something a priest could do once in his lifetime. And some never got the opportunity to do it. And the only way he got an opportunity to do it is because it was his division's turn to serve. And then they drew lights on top of that to find out who was going to get to go in there and burn the incense. So all these people are gathered outside, outside in the temple court. And then there was this inner room where the incense was burned. So he went into this inner room and it was somewhat dimly lit. There in the flickering firelight, he's getting ready to burn this incense before God on behalf of the people who have gathered outside to worship and to pray. So he's going in to represent them before God to burn the incense. And while he's in there carrying out this ritual, this angel appears poof, out of nowhere at the right side of the altar and I'm sure lightens up the place. And of course he's gripped and he's startled with fear as most all of us would be as well. And notice what the angel says in verse 13. Do not be afraid. Over and over we find the angel saying that whenever they show up on the scene, the first thing out of their mouth is, do not be afraid or, or, or fear not. Because it is such a startling experience for an angel all of a sudden to show up. The angel says, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to give him the name John. Now apparently they had been praying for years to have a son. Maybe 20 years Maybe 30 years, maybe more. They had prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, but they were unable to have children. Now, in that day and time, if you had a house full of young'uns, you were considered very, very blessed. I mean, the favor of God was on you. That's the way they viewed it. If you couldn't have any children, it was a sign of God's disfavor. It, it, it was a sign of not being blessed. In fact, some people would even jump to the conclusion that God was punishing you because of some sin you had committed. And Zechariah and Elizabeth were looked down upon socially because they were not able to have children. Now, now Luke goes out of his way to let us know that the reason they couldn't have children is she was simply barren and it had nothing to do with them being punished for sin. If you'll notice, it, the text tells us that uh, they were righteous people. They were both, both very, very righteous people. Uh, they, they were living in conformity to, to God's standards. Uh, verse 6, notice what it says. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, obeying all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. So they couldn't have children simply because biologically she was just unable to have any children. But they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And God finally sends them an, an answer through the angel Gabriel. And he makes this appearance and makes this announcement and says they are to give the child the name John, which means God is gracious. God is going to bestow grace upon them. He is going to show His favor upon them. And they are going to have this child, even though it seems impossible in their old age, God is going to provide a way for them to have a child. So Zechariah and Elizabeth will no longer be stigmatized and look down upon in the community. The angel tells them that this child is going to be a very special child. Uh, he will be a joy and a delight. Sometimes children are not always a joy and a delight. Sometimes they can bring a lot of pain into people's lives, especially when they do not honor their parents, especially when they do not keep the Word of God and they live contrary to what God wants. They can bring pain. 
But that's not going to be the way it is with this child. This child is going to be a delight and a joy. And there's a lot of people in the nation will rejoice because of him and his, his birth. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Special child. And notice no fermented drink will touch his lips. Well, what does that mean? Well, in that day and time, especially in the Old Testament era, they had people under a Nazarite vow. This is a special vow people would take. And part of that included not partaking of alcoholic beverages. I've told you all before, it involves the three Bs. No booze, no bodies, no blade. Which means I didn't drink anything fermented. They couldn't uh, touch dead bodies and they couldn't cut their hair. Now was John under a full Nazarite vow? I'm not sure. It just says the fermented drink part. But I think it's reasonable to conclude that he was probably under a full Nazarite vow. He was probably a... I picture him as when he grew up kind of a, a grizzly Adams looking guy, if you remember him. Long hair, he's outdoors and long beard and you know dressed in camel hair and had a belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Just an outdoors dude that preached down by the riverbank. That's who he grew up to be. So most likely he's, he's under this uh, Nazarite vow, which means he's very special and he's set apart for the Lord's use. Now, you would think Zechariah would be overjoyed, right? Finally, they're going to have this child. They've been praying and praying and praying and praying. And not only are they going to have a child, they're going to have a special child. You'd say, well, man, I bet he is just overjoyed. I bet he's happy. I bet he's grinning from ear to ear inside that temple there in the flickering firelight and the, and the shimmering angel. Well, not exactly. Let's look at his response. Verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. That's really not what the angel wanted to hear. The angel wanted to hear a man full of joy full of excitement. Most importantly, he wanted to hear a man full of faith. But he's questioning the angel. You could even say he's questioning the angel's integrity. How do I know you're telling me the truth, angel? Not a good thing to ask an angel. So the angel says, okay, you want a sign that I'm telling the truth? I'm about to give you one. Verse 19, the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. In other words, I have access to Almighty God. I know what God's will is. I know what God wants me to carry out. You know, I'm, I have access to Him, unlike you. And then he says, I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. In other words, it's good news, you should be happy. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. In other words, you want a sign, you're going to get a sign. The sign is going to be that you're not going to be able to speak until this child is born. And if you look at verse 62 of Luke chapter 1, it also seems to imply that he couldn't hear as well. So not only can he not talk, he probably can't hear. So he's inside this temple and he sees this vision and this happens to him. And the people are waiting outside and they're wondering, what in the world is going on in there? Verse 21, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering, why has he stayed so long in the temple? When he came out, he couldn't speak. They realized he had seen a vision of the temple for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Okay, so Zechariah has been in there. He comes out, can't talk, probably can't hear. All he can do is, and he doesn't know sign language. So all we can imagine is he's trying to communicate to them he has seen some kind of vision. So I started wondering, well, how in the world would you communicate that you had seen an angel? And I thought, maybe. Halo, maybe? I don't even know if they believed in halos back then. Maybe wings? What do you think? Or maybe shimmer? I saw a shimmer. 
who knows? But he was trying to let them know, man, I just saw an angel and an angel spoke to me. And they realized that there was some, some type of, of vision that he had seen. But he couldn't tell them. And again, I think he couldn't, he couldn't even hear what they were, they were saying to him. By the way, I've entitled this morning's message, Doubt and Dumb. Zechariah had doubted. And because he doubted, he was struck with this dumbness, unable to speak until the day of the birth. What I want us to take note of here is Zechariah was doing everything right up until this point. Again, he was righteous. What does righteous mean? It means conforming to God's standards. I really believe one of the ways we, we prepare for Christmas is by being righteous people. Comparing our lives, conforming our lives, I should say, to God's precepts and His holy principles. But specifically, I want you to take note of what He's doing. Yes, we know we're supposed to be righteous, but specifically what's going on here? Well, for one, He's carrying out His priestly duties. He's going into the temple. He's there at the temple. He's making time to be at the temple. He's voluntarily serving the Lord. And he's burning this incense before God. The people are outside in a, in a kind of worship service. They're gathered together in faith. And they're gathered together and having this, this time of, of, of corporate prayer. So, so we really see ritual written all over this. A lot of times when we think of a ritual, unfortunately, we, we think of a ritual as being something empty, devoid of meaning, going through the motions, you know, like I'm just being mindless. But that, that's not the idea here. I really believe he, he was carrying out these rituals in a very sincere manner because the text says he was a righteous man. And part of his righteousness involved practicing these rituals. And as a result of practicing the rituals, he put himself in a position to be blessed. Now think about that. By practicing the rituals in faith, out of obedience to Almighty God, he put himself in this position for God's favor to rest upon him. And I started thinking about this. Is that not the ideal way to prepare yourself for Christmas? Is by practicing the rituals and putting yourself in a position for God's favor. You say, well, John, what are you talking about? Rituals. We're not very ritualistic. Well, I would agree that we're not a ritualistic, heavy ritual church, but we try to follow the rituals that we find in the New Testament. And there's, there's several rituals that we find the early church engaged in. By the way, Scripture tells us that we're all priests. You realize that? We're a universal priesthood of believers. You may not have thought of yourself as a priest, but Scripture says you are a priest. You don't need some man to represent you before God. You represent yourself before God. You are a priest and Jesus Christ is the high priest. So like Zechariah, we're priests. And like Zechariah, there's certain rituals that God expects us to perform. You say, what, what do you mean, John? We do ritual. Well, to begin with, I would consider baptism a ritual, wouldn't you? Now it's... It's not supposed to be empty and devoid of meaning and done in a faithless way. If that's the way it's done, it's nothing more than taking a bath. But it's coming in faith and out of obedience that, that, that sins are remitted and receive the Holy Spirit and we come up out of the water and walk in newness in life. But it's, it's, in, it's in faith that we perform the ritual and we set ourselves up, put ourselves in a position to be blessed. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, uh, we see... Really, the, the, the blessings actually what put them in a position to be blessed, and they were blessed. Acts 2.42, these are the rituals that the early church engaged in. And we see four of them. Acts chapter 2, incidentally, Luke, same one who, who wrote, wrote the passage we're looking at this morning, we believe also wrote Acts chapter 2, verse 42. said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I'm going to call those rituals. 
It's something that they devoted themselves to doing. In other words, it was important to them. Now, if we're not careful during the Christmas season, we can neglect these four rituals that are mentioned here. We can get so caught up in all the hustle and the bustle and and the buying and and the planning and, and the traveling that we neglect the rituals. I think it's very important if we're going to really celebrate the Christmas season that we make time for the rituals. Again, I'm not saying in an empty, mindless kind of way, but in a, in a, in a way that's being obedient to God and in a way that's full of faith. First of all, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What does that mean? Well, for one, it means that they, they devoted themselves to being together. They didn't have a copy of the New Testament like we do today. That hadn't come on the scene yet. They would come together as a body of believers. In fact, this entire passage speaks of their togetherness, their their oneness, their, their sense of community. They came together for the apostles' teaching. Try to make the apostles' teaching a part of your Christmas celebration. Try to find the time to to come together with God's people to study His Word. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 states, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. It's important that we come together as a body of believers. We need each other. We need the encouragement. You know, they say Christmas is one of the saddest times of the year. Some of you are saying, well, how in the world could that be? Well, people get older. They, certain people are no longer with them anymore and they're reflecting back on the memories and the way things used to be. And now things aren't so hot maybe or uh, they, they long for people that are no longer there. Just, there's, it can be a very depressing time. We really need to spend time together. And by the way, that's one of the signs of depression when people withdraw from others. God says, no, I want you to be together. I want you to come together with your church family because you will find encouragement. So as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, it's important that we not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And and it might just be my imagination, but I don't think it is. It seems like maybe 10 to 15 years ago, during the month of December, church used to just be full. That was the time of year. We even got a a saying for called Crusters, people that come during Christmas and Easter. Uh, But I've noticed over the last several years, at least five years or so, that's some of our lowest time of attendance is during Christmas. Can you believe that? During the very time we're celebrating Emmanuel, God with us, coming in the baby Jesus, that's our lowest time of attendance. I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but some of the people are going to watch on YouTube. Maybe they'll get convicted. But Christmas is not a time to slack off. If we're really going to celebrate Jesus like we should, we need to come together as a body. God wants us to come together. He wants us to come together corporately as a group. They also devoted themselves to the fellowship That's coming together and sharing together. That's kind of a general term for sharing together. After church this morning, we're going to share a meal together. That's going to be a a time of fellowship. Those times are important because we're a church family. and We're going to become a dysfunctional family if we do not spend time together. So we try to create environments where people can get together and get to know one another and find the encouragement that God wants us to have. The early church devoted themselves to these these rituals, to the breaking of bread. Not only does that refer to literally breaking bread and sharing a meal together, that term also referred to the Lord's Supper. They made time for that ritual. Acts chapter 20 verse 7 tells us the church met on the first day of the week to break bread. That's why we have the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day. We come together primarily to partake of the Lord's Supper and remember Jesus Christ and what He's done for us. That's a ritual. If I'm not mistaken, Chad even prayed about it being a ritual this morning. But he didn't want it. He, he, he was basically praying, don't let it be an empty ritual. We want it to be a ritual that's full of meaning. Let's not neglect the Lord's Supper as we prepare for the birth of God's Son. And lastly, there is the ritual of prayer. This entire incident revolves around prayer. They've been praying for a son. The text says that the people are gathered outside praying. 
Finally, the prayer gets answered. So it's, it's prayers all over the place here. Even the, even the burning of the incense reminds us of prayer. Oftentimes in God's Word, prayer is symbolic of the prayers of God's people. You know, as the incense goes up before God, that's symbolic of the prayers going up before God. As he's in there burning that incense, that's when Gabriel tells Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Maybe you need God to come through for you in some kind of way. I want to encourage you. Don't give up. Keep praying. But make sure you're a righteous person as well. It's, it's, it's that prayer the Bible says of a righteous person. It's powerful. And Zechariah was a, was a righteous man. His wife was a righteous woman. And they prayed and prayed and prayed. And finally, the prayer was answered. The only bad part is he began to doubt when the angel came to him and actually told him his prayer was going to be answered. I know that sounds ironic, doesn't it? But how many times have we not been the same way? Prayer is answered and we're like, is that really an answer? Hmm. Don't doubt. I wanted to encourage you as we come up to Christmas, as we go through this season, find time to perform the rituals. And above all, perform the rituals in faith, not in doubt. Let's pray. Hi there, I'm John Wagner, minister of New Discovery Christian Church here in Hernando, Mississippi. And I wanna thank you for visiting our YouTube channel. I do hope you enjoy the sermons and I hope the Lord builds you up through his word as I do my best to present it to you. If you're ever in the area, feel free to drop by and check us out live and in person. Once again, thank you for checking out our YouTube channel.